this is so fun. I, I just looked at the participants list and I, I'm seeing Carolyn Decker who put together and edited the critical edition of a drama of the Southwest, um, which is the truly the fountain of all of my knowledge about it. This is the reason uh, I read it when it came out in 2016 and it was, um, Carolyn, your work is the reason I thought about this uh, this year as I, I was putting together my column um, on, uh, on tumor and on this work. I guess I should say in that connection that I, um, I wrote about tumor this year. I'm always looking for excuses to read about, write about Jean Tumor uh, with whom I, um, of whom I am no scholar, but with whom I've been um, fairly obsessed for much of my life. And this year, given all of the happenings, I don't need to recite them for you. Um, there was no theater and I'm a theater critic at the New Yorker and um, for a while there, now it's a little bit better, for a while there, there was uh, really nothing happening in the theater world, mostly sort of maybe Zoom renditions of things that people had already seen and there wasn't much to review, but I still wanted to keep doing my job. Uh, and so my thoughts turned to Gene Toomer, um, partially because the atmosphere in my own home was so much like the atmosphere as I imagined it uh, in a, in one of Gene Toomer's homes uh, in Bucks County, Philadelphia, what he called the, the mill house. He would, uh, at the end of the day, have a kind of, uh, you might call it a drama of uh, rest or as he called it, deserving time. Uh, toward the end of the day, um, later in his life, Toomer becomes more and more, unfortunately, of a functioning alcoholic. At the end of the day, he says, okay, after everybody's finished their work, and we'll talk more about what that work was. Um, for conveniently for him, it was work putting together his house, but it was also uh, construed as a kind of spiritual practice. Um, but at the end of the day, everybody that lived in his house and worked with him, and his sort of acolytes that he had collected over his years, uh, would come together and have a what he called a deserving hour uh, of sort of drinking and talking about art, often arguing with Tumor about art. And um, this was the atmosphere in my house. Uh, in those early days of the pandemic, just my wife and I sitting around talking about the things that we were reading and trying to distract ourselves. Um, so that was the genesis of uh, my rereading of uh, of this interesting play. I don't think you can call it a great play, but it's an interesting play. And I think it talks to a bunch of the, um, the preoccupations and the worries and the lasting obsessions as, of Tumor as we meet him in really all of his work. He's uh, really uh, quite consistent that way. His, uh, it's easy, often too easy, to read too much, uh, too much autobiography into the sort of corpus of a person. But with Tumor, um, it's, it's never a bad guide. Um, Tumor was born in um, 1894 in Washington, D.C. And he was the grandson of a really interesting American character, PBS uh, Pinchback, who was, uh, I believe, the 21st governor of Louisiana and uh, was very mixed racially, Pinchback was. He claimed his African ancestry sort of intermittently um, uh, his, his, his mother was what they called the time a mulatto and also claimed uh, links to several different Native American tribes. Um, and that lore of Pinchback, who was one of the sort of direct, after, the direct reconstruction era, that first post-civil rights moment when for a moment there, the South is free to, uh, is open to uh, Black involvement in politics, not just in voting, but in serving as a kind of representative, as Pinchback did as governor. Governor uh, Pinchback, by the way, was the only black governor in America until the 1990s where uh, Doug Wilder comes into Virginia. So uh, he really is a kind of represents a lost opportunity uh, for black political engagement. Uh, the lore of his grandfather for, uh, for Toomer becomes um, a kind of um, exotic hint of what the world might possibly, uh, what the world might possibly be. When, when Tumor goes to college in uh, University of Wisconsin-Madison, uh, 
uh, he quickly uh, fails at that, at the work of being in college. And it's never really quite explained, but he kind of feels unsettled. And he, over the next couple of years, um, but the, the years uh, 1914 to 1918, he goes to five other colleges. Um, the only account he ever gives uh, of this in the autobiography that he never quite finishes is that he's feeling restless and that this sojourn among these places has something to do with his uh, desire to synthesize all of the American strains that he feels um, present within himself. He's deciding, and this becomes a trope for anybody who talks about tumor, he's deciding whether um, to identify with this uh, black Southern part of his identity to um, identify with the, the the hints or the rumors of native ancestry or with the larger mainstream white culture, which seems ready to accept him based on uh, based on his looks. Here is a uh, I forgot to turn the slide before, but here's Governor Pinchback, his his grandfather. Um, but something interesting happens between 1918 and 1921, which is that he decides to become uh, a writer. And in 1921, kind of, I guess, loosely fired by this, um, by this ambition, he goes down south to Georgia to um, accept a post as a teacher um, of a rural school. And he feels incredibly out of place there, but he also is captivated by um, what he calls, uh, what, what are the folk songs of the South that later uh, become sort of the backbone spiritually and formally of his great work, uh, Cain. That if you know Tumor, this is why you know him as Cain. Um, and it's interesting, and I think this inaugurates a pattern in Tumor's life, which becomes apparent in a drama of the Southwest, which we'll talk about a bit, um, which is that his writing and especially his attempts at drama, um, this is what is of interest uh, with him for me as a as a uh, theater critic, is that he takes advantage of the sort of uh, inescapably dialectic uh, form of theater, the the back and forth of it. He uses that as a way uh, to further immerse himself in a place. His attempts at drama, which interestingly, he's a very committed dramatist, even though he barely ever finishes a play. So Cain, which is essentially the result of this trip to Georgia, uh, this, this sort of uncertain northerner, uh, his immersion into the folk culture of the South, um, and, and, and this attempt to harmonize himself with what W.E.B. Du Bois will call the spiritual strivings of the South. Um, that is what ends up being Cain. The structure of Cain is sort of an early uh, overture, all focused the, in, the, in the poems and the fictional sketches in the first section on the folk culture of the South. Um, the second follows um, many of the same uh, Black people that we see in their sort of what I guess Tumor would call their native environment in the South, now come up to places like uh, industrial urban Chicago. So this initial move of displacement that on some level um, reproduces the, the, the experience of Tumor's own family. And the third, and this is interesting, um, Kane is so beguiling because it uh, includes so many different uh, genres. Interestingly, Kane culminates in a play uh, called Cabinets. It's about a man named Ralph Cabanis going down to Georgia to uh, be a school teacher and his disorientation with this sojourn. He is exactly, you know, T Tumor in his letters and says, I think it's a letter to Waldo Frank, his great mentor and uh, sometimes benefactor. He says, Cabanis is me. Um, and so drama for Tumor becomes this vehicle to navigate the logic of the sojourn, the journey, which is so much, um, if there's any great Tumerian image, it is the image of the, the journey, the sojourn. Um, he's always moving restlessly. In some ways, uh, you could say, as Henry Louis Gates says, you know, um, in flight from himself and from what he knows as his racial inheritance. 
but also uh, is, is, is racial inheritance that is, but also I think um, moving toward uh, his, his, his true goal of a kind of dissolution into the country. Um, one of his worries when he goes to Georgia is that the folk cultures, these folk cultures will cease to exist. Uh, that every, that the sort of teleological movement of America is away from ethnic enclosure, away from what we might call identity politics and toward uh, dissolution into the greater American thing. In that way, he's not unlike, he's not too much unlike um, someone like Ralph Ellison, um, who, who figures America as a kind of, um, as a mulatto nation, in fact, as a, as a, as a product of that mixture and that our, white, our whites are more black than anybody else's whites and our blacks are more, whites than, more white than anybody else is black. Um, but in any case, Kane, you know, it's funny because um, speaking of Ellison here in this, this great image, this great uh, initial dust jacket from the uh, Beinecke's collection. Um, the success of Kane is a kind of cataclysm for Toomer. He always says that he's dissatisfied with it. And I think what he's truly dissatisfied with is a quote like this one, by far the most impressive product of the Negro Renaissance. It ranks with Richard Wright's native son and Ralph Ellison's Invisible Man. This kind of thing, uh, Kane, maybe paradoxically for him, he, he, maybe he meant it and especially the act of cabinets, which you know, uh, is almost a coming of age of this man, Ralph Kavnis, uh indoctrination and um, tutelage on, in the South. Um, maybe he thought that it would be an agent of that kind of dissolution, but in fact, it was not. It labeled him as a black writer, which is what he did uh, not want. Uh, he expressly did not want. Um, and so something else really interesting happens to him around this time, which is that 19, in 1924, um, as many folks know, he is uh, inducted into, recruited into, falls into th the thrall of, I don't want to uh, too tightly circumscribe the trajectory of this uh, conversion, I guess we can call it, um, into the work of George Gurdjieff, the um, spiritualist uh, who, uh, whose work was, and I, and I think every, anybody, anytime somebody talks about the Gurdjieff work, the, the, the W there is very much capitalized, um, was about a sort of harmonizing of mind and body and spirit um, through different sort of, I would call them sort of proto-yoga movements um, and um, mantras, and also a, a steady diet of uh, physical labor. So very conveniently for Gurdjieff and very conveniently for Toomer later when he becomes a sort of leader in America of Gurdjieff's work is uh, a lot of the, the so-called work is, and then we clean up the backyard. And so whoever's house it is, this is a double benefit for them. Uh, Toomer, I, I mentioned the work that happened at his house, that is what was happening in his house. Um, and so the deserving hour of which I spoke was in some ways a respite from his own, his own kind of uh, impromptu uh, uh, group of student cum contractors. Um, but again, the, the, the Gurdjieff work does kind of two things for him. One, it sort of deepens in him this impulse toward um, synthesis, toward bringing together. And then the other thing that it does is that it brings him into contact with um, the people Eventually, it brings him into contact with the people who will um, bring him on another sojourn to the Southwest. Um, two more quickly, because he is, by all accounts, um, and you, you saw it in that first uh, photograph, by, by all accounts, he's a very um, handsome uh, and alluring and uh, charismatic man. Um, his, however deep and uh, difficult his sort of psychodramas, they are not uh, apparent when he's talking to you. He is very convincing. And so he very quickly, um, and he's also this kind of organic um, improvised theorist. So his contact with the Gurdjieff work immediately um, 
sort of makes it into his writing and it makes it into, he decides that he should be a leader of the work in Gurdjieff, um, at least in the beginning until they have some conflicts with the money, um, totally says, yes, you should be one of my emissaries. So um, Tumor helps to set up a Gurdjieff group in, in Harlem. Uh, he goes to Chicago and becomes a very, uh, very influential leader of the work there. And he comes into contact uh, with um, and really helps draws as followers of a kind. Um, folks like uh, Mabel Dodge Lewin, uh, the great philanthropist and patron of the arts who um, helps to start the Taos art colony uh, in New Mexico. Um, he also sort of throughout the 20s has become friends with other people who will uh, become members of, of that art colony, including Georgia O'Keeffe. One, uh, I guess if you're interested in uh, literary personal intrigue, one really interesting passage in his life is, the, is his um, encounters with, friendship with um, Alfred Stiglitz and um, especially Georgia O'Keeffe. Um, after Toomer's first wife dies in the process of giving birth to his child, he has a, uh, a I guess, a moment of intimacy with Georgia O'Keeffe for, for, for many months um, after he goes to visit her here in New, New York, but upstate in uh, Lake George. Um, they start up a very quite beautiful correspondence. This is Georgia O'Keeffe's handwriting in a, uh, in a letter to, uh, to Toomer. Uh, uh, she says, it's hard to read. Uh, you seem to have given me a strangely beautiful feeling of balance that makes the days seem very precious to me. Uh, you seem to have come into life in such a quiet, surprising fashion. Uh, and this is a moment where she's been, um, she's been sick for a time uh, and he helps to uh, in some ways re-inspire her and, and she does the same for him. In some ways, you know, some people have talked about their relationship as a mutual reinforcement of a sort of uh, drama common to both of them, which is their ardent dislike for the tendency of the outer world to try to put them in place, Tumor as a black writer, uh, O'Keefe as a woman painter. Um, their desire to um, step out of that sort of particularity and reach for something more synthesized, something more universal is something that makes them not only um, briefly lovers, but sort of comrades in art. Um, and so anyway, I, I, I realize now that I've taken a longer time to get to a drama of the Southwest, but um, in part because of his sort of uh, prospecting to, to potentially uh, create a Gurdjieff community, um, Toomer starts to make trips down to Taos, uh, New Mexico, uh, partially to visit Mabel Dodge Lewin, who wants to give him the money to start a Gurdjieff uh, Institute in, in the Southwest. And again, um, what this journey does is give Toomer another way that he thinks that he can kind of reconceive the country along um, ethnic, regional, uh, but ultimately spiritual lines. Um, one of the beautiful, I mean, it's interesting to go from um, some lines from uh, Cadmus, that's that dramatic section in Cain, and some lines in a drama of the Southwest, which again is highly um, autobiographical. It's about a man named Tom Elliott who goes down to the Southwest, to Taos, uh, to write. It's essentially exactly what Toomer does. And interestingly, Toomer, despite his flaws, seems to be quite self-aware. Uh, self, uh, self Tom Elliott's a lot like Toomer. He is um, idealistic and given to expansive talking, uh, not really noticing whether anybody's listening to him. He, uh, he too observes the deserving hour and looks forward to it basically all day. Um, he too um, is interestingly obsessed with the currents of the day. He talks a lot about uh, feminism and how the, the, <laughs> the community in Taos um, has become a kind of, um, he calls it a, a, a female fascism. 
um, Tumor is very uh, chauvinistic all through his life. Um, and, but he's very interested in, in, in themes like feminism in revolutionary socialism. Um, and again, his forays into drama always sort of have something to do with his interest in the time and his interest in harmony and synthesis. So um, back when Kane is written, he's also been working on uh, plays that he barely, there's a very short sketch that's called Balo, which is a uh, one act sketch, uh, which he calls a, of Negro life. It's a kind of, it's the kind of thing that could have served as another playlet uh, that would have slotted more easily into the first section of Kane. He's got a, a play called Natalie Mann, uh, which another tumor play, which is as yet unproduced. Um, and it's all about revolutionary feminism. Um, after the trip to uh, the Southwest, he goes to India and he writes, again, starts and does not finish several plays. One's called Colombo Madras Mail. The other's called Pilgrim Did You Say? And, and it's about his sort of disillusionment with India because he's had this sort of idealizing relationship with the East um, and the, the, the uh, what he would call the East, with the philosophies uh, that seem to him exotic, but seem again, a source of potentially spiritual power. Um, so anyway, um, listen to this from Cabinus, right? This man trying to uh, orient himself vis-a-vis -vis the American South. This is from Cabinus. Um, on the one hand, he says the hills and valleys were humming, heaving with folk songs, the kind of beautiful lyricism that we often associate with Kane. But then he also, in his room, in this sort of first, this opening scene in Cabinets of odd despair, he's kind of this, we see this man suffering and we're not really ever sure why. He says, this loneliness, dumbness, awful and tangible oppression is enough to drive a man insane. Someone dealing with the consequences of a trip. Um, on the other hand, and uh, um, Carolyn talks wonderfully about this line and this, Carolyn Decker does, uh, talks wonderfully about this line and his thought about the, the potentiality that he finds in the journey. Um, one of my favorite lines of uh, a drama of the Southwest is intoned by this, there's a character called an interpreter who often will set scenes and it's almost like the narrator figure in our town uh, for those who love theater. Um, and so at the beginning of the play, and you can see that in these notes of tumors for the, for the play, it's, I mean, it's, it's interesting because these are very abstract. The great question of life, if human existence is for the purpose that human beings may develop souls, if struggle is the ba basic condition by means of which souls are developed, then all difficulties, all struggles are valuable. Um, that's his notes language, but that's also very much the language of the early parts of the play. Uh, that some of the stage directions are poetic and totally unstageable, by the way. Um, but then also the interpreter gives this overture and you can see to him we're trying to resolve some of those tensions that exist in the mind of a person like Ralph Cabinus. Here he is um, on this sort of trip to the Southwest that Tom Elliott is, uh, is undertaking. Uh, they will come Southwestward, he says, not on horseback or in a covered wagon, but driving a motor car. Even so, they will strike experience here, as man ever does when his heart is freshly given to a place. And I think that that is one of the, uh, in this forgotten work, that is one of the signal lines of all of Sumer's work to me. Um, this continued struggle, this constant effort to give his heart freshly to a place, um, seems like a person in search of a, in a, of, of a kind of Zion, a, a final home that would do all of his synthesis for him. Um, but he here does it uh, again through the language and through the, the, the logic of a play. Um, a drama of the Southwest is much more direct and much less poetic in its address than, than Cabinus has heretofore uh, most uh, successful play has been. Um, again, he, he lays out almost a psychic um, disclosure in what is, are supposed to be his, uh, his set design um, or his, his stage instructions. He says, uh, Here's, here are some stage instructions. You know, anybody, if there are any set designers in the audience, just uh, try to stage this, okay? Uh, 
Then silence again, and life becomes existence again. An existence focused for a time in a group of singing men expands to the mountain and the close stars. So this cosmic uh, representation of, again, this, this, this journey toward something, this experiment, if you want, with a place. Um, also really, uh, before, we, before I stop, I think I've already taken up much more time than I, than I planned to. Um, there's a, interestingly, he, all, he sets up this dynamic that I, anybody who's spent a lot of time in a college town would, you would know as a sort of student versus townie dynamic. Um, these, uh, these locals called Buckter T. Fact and U. Beam Riesling. Uh, Risling, that is, I always want to call him after, name him after a sweet wine, but no, it's Risling as in the sun. Um, and these folks sit on the roof and they talk about the colonists like, like Tumor. So again, this odd self-awareness that he understands himself as a kind of tourist. Um, but they sit on this roof and they talk about the colonists that are descending on, the, on this corner of theirs of the country. Um, one of them is sort of in the clouds and other the other, has this sort of proletarian orientation. Um, he's described by Tumor as being above art. Um, Ubeam, giving some of the sort of odd essentialism that is characteristic of, of Tumor's work, um, says the spirit of the Indian still lives in and dominates this land. Disappearing elsewhere, it is vital here. So again, this idea that culture uh, is always in danger of disappearing under the sort of gravity of American togetherness. Um, vital like these hills to this little cluster of earth built houses, the entire world comes. Buckter T. Fax says, comes and goes as fast as it can. And why? What's to be seen here? This is the person that he doesn't care about all this. He does not care about, he doesn't care about the spirit of the Indian. He says, comes and goes as fast as it can. And why? What's to be seen here? One bank, one newspaper, grocery and drug stores like you can see anywhere, an armory, a baseball field, a fish hatchery, bad roads, the plaza, and a dump here, dump heap. Why should anyone come all this way to get dust in his eyes? As for me, it means a job. And so this opposition between this exalted, ethnically fired view of the country, and on the other hand, a much more pragmatic vision. Now, I will always associate Tumor with this, with the more high flown version, but his inclusion of Buckter T. Fact. Uh, to me shows so much, uh, shows so so much and so well how on some level ironic tumor, tumor could be and how again self-aware he was about the, I don't know, silliness or idealism or um, impossibility perhaps of his, uh, of his project. Um, here is a is again from the from this wonderful collection. I, uh, here's a setting forth some more of this 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 language that's supposed to be uh, scene directions. You know, night black, night of the New Mexican Southwest, a luminous black sky, and the stars seem close to Earth. Um, that the logic there. The, the psychic meant to be meant to be made visual. We'd call it a failure, I think, in theatrical terms, but for us, it's very self-disclosing about Tumor um, and about his interests as um, a playwright, feeble as his playwriting career ended up being, that he wanted to use the, uh, the particularities of the form in order to um, work out some of his minute sometimes and often grandiose uh, feelings about the country, um, his worries about dissolution, his questions about identity, and um, indeed uh, his many problems with himself. Um, so I'll stop there. Because